Hey everybody, and a welcome back to another exciting episode of Indie Film Cafe. I'm your host, Jonathan Moody, and I've got an awesome, awesome show for you guys. Um, first of all, I've got my co-host here. Which, what's up, Paul A. Presenza? Also known as Mukau Man. <laughs> Mukau Man. <laughs> all right. All right. That works. Um, that works for me. Um, and then we've also got uh, Jessa Flux here. How you doing, Jessa? Yay! Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Just super busy and um, want to take a nap, but you know it's fine. It happens. Me too. Everybody <laughs> wants to take naps. You know those are nice. Um, they are. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are here to talk about the. I, I'm gonna say it was at, well. It was made in 1990, but I think it was released in 96 or 97 ish area. Was it 96? Yeah, it was middle. Was it... it was mid nineties. Yeah, yeah. It was released then, but it was actually like filmed in nineteen ninety, and then it got released later. Uh, there's, I think, there's a lot of stuff with that, but uh, I don't really know too much backstory on that, which I wish I did. Yeah, um, I think it was a Namco issue. Yeah. So, but uh, before we get in, we're talking about the God nineteen ninety six movie, Sergeant Kabuki Man, NYPD. Yay. I'm, I always forget the titles these days, like forget announcing the titles before, <laughs> like, you know, people are just like, what, what movie are we talking about? Oh, OK, that one. Um, but yes, I, I'm really excited, um, mainly because uh, Jessa was in uh, was in Kentucky with us and she was a Tromet. So Yay. I had to get her to come on, do this one. Mm hmm. You know, and you, well, uh, it's okay. Your dog can bark. That's <laughs> that happens. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure Rocky would bark too if he heard your dog. So, you know, uh, my dog. But anyway, um, before we get into this movie, though, let's go into some mood, mood music. music. All right, and we are back. All right, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the uh, the film *Sergeant Kabuki Man*, which had its own theme song. It uh, did you did you see Paul that I posted a um, what is it? it was it was even had like a pilot to a cartoon. Oh yeah, oh, they yeah. were gonna they were gonna do it just like the Toxic Crusaders. I I remember that, and I remember there was even talk at one point of a, a, a tv series although of course that never that never came to well fruition. i know the cartoon i don't know about the tv series but i know yeah. uh the cartoon uh that they tried to do one and i saw some of it. i saw clips of the cartoon for oh, that's cool sergeant kabuki man it looked fun like it looked like a show i would have watched in the 90s you know or whatever as a kid i mean the movie itself is pretty much a cartoon I mean, well, like, live action cartoon. Were you gonna say, Jessa? It's like super comic booky. Mm hmm. And so we're gonna get into that because that's a little bit of the background that I found out. So this film, on like I said, it was kind of it made in nineteen ninety. It was a joke originally. Like the idea was there was a character in Toxic Avenger two or three, whatever, whatever whichever one it was. <laughs> and probably three and there was a character named kabuki boy and all of the editors were laughing their ass off at this like kabuki boy character so he made some uh Malloy took note of that made an announcement saying oh the next movie that troma is gonna do is uh kabuki boy you know right and uh this one of the guys who was one of the funding people for uh toxic avenger it was, you know, Japanese and said, you know, this our culture would love to have a Kabuki character. Uh, so we would we would love to fund that. Then they went to, yeah, that big company uh, who's like an amusement park company who funded the film with Damn ideas hell. of having action figures. And what they wanted was a PG-13 style like or PG style Kabuki character, you know. And Lloyd can't write that. I was going to you know? say, he went to the wrong person. 
they uh -huh. yeah so lloyd decided to write uh so anytime they would think of something like they were trying to like reel them down and try to get them to whatever you know and he would just think of like crazier you know like kids getting killed and you know things that just don't work for the mainstream audience that's why um, i love them yeah and that was that was that so uh so anyway the movie was uh, originally uh they gave uh 1.5 million dollars um and then they ended up uh, bumping it up to 4 million dollars this is probably the biggest production uh trauma's ever had you know, I think uh, even about, uh, especially counting like uh, hashtag sh uh, uh, Shakespeare shitstorm, which was their newest one. I think it only cost them probably like five hundred grand. Like they try to keep it pretty cheap. Um, I I could be wrong, could be more, but uh, they try to keep it kind of cheap because you know these movies usually get sold by them, and they you know it's it's not like going to Hollywood or something. You know, and you could tell there was a lot more interesting special effects that you generally don't see in a Lloyd Coffin production that they were <coughs> this time around. So oh, yeah. that was pretty like, cool. Shocked by the effects that they were so good. Like it, it and there was just like some of the things I'm like, where did they get all these beer cans? Like, oh like where do you put out like a Craigslist that? I mean I know it's like made in 1990 but like how do you get like a ton of beer cans for an apartment scene like that's crazy I'm, they had a good oh, prop department Ugh. it comes with the money because since they had more money uh lloyd said in one of the things he wrote in all i need to know about filmmaker learn from a toxic avenger one of the things he wrote was that a lot of people complain about you know uh if you get more if you get more uh, money, you know, like, you know, there's more problems, I guess, or something with the set. He <laughs> felt the exact opposite way. The more money, the more stuff he could just relax. You know, he didn't need to do 20,000 things, you know. Right. And he had a lot of things like chase car chase scenes in New York City, which is not cheap. And that's why generally people don't film that kind of stuff in New York City. Interestingly enough, that one scene with the the clowns and all that other stuff that's happening, uh, I'm not sure if it was used in the one before, but it it is the same one they use for every other uh, trauma movie. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like a just a a thing you see in every trauma movie. There'll be the the car flipping over and everything yeah. and exploding because they did <laughs> that once. They own that, so they're gonna <laughs> throw it in. Everything, Everything they do, you know, yep. and it totally makes sense for them to do that because, you know, like why, you know, and that helps. Too. I mean, I, I think even if the movie looks completely different and then that scene gets thrown, they would still they would still we, do it. We got to get back to that whole clown thing because that's my favorite part of the film. So we'll we'll, we'll touch on that. Oh, a little we'll bit. definitely touch on that. Now, uh, Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about this like like the story behind this movie the story behind this movie like well, what was what is the story of it you know the story is there was a um detective that went to a kabuki show and people started shooting um he didn't know no one knew that it was actually a not a the show like the <laughs> stage Show. and um finally he realizes like oh they're actually shooting everybody um he seemed kind of like an idiot but like he uh went on stage to try to save everybody and this old man like breathed this life or the spirit in him and all of a sudden the detective started his face started like having kabuki makeup on it um he started uh his clothes started turning into like japanese robes those little like kabuki shoes those little wooden like sandals, those are really funny that's my favorite part is when they fly through the sky I think. <laughs> um but then from then on he has to learn how to deal with this like superpower he has and how to like use it for good and there's a little love story which is kind of cute lotus um, lotus yeah there was um she was really hot uh i really enjoyed her boobs i'll be honest with you they're very cute 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's really like how it gets set up. And then he just like saves the day and New York loves him. Exactly. It's wow, that's a good way to sum it up, pretty much. Oh yeah. you forgot you forgot the evil one though. There's the oh, evil yeah. one. Um uh, well I just did it wasn't my favorite part. Like they were all he kept they everybody kept war- warning him like the evil one is on the way or whatever. And then like the well, like I don't I didn't maybe I didn't get it. Like I was just like, why is this guy turning into like it was like a larvae, like it was like a like wormy like larvae thing, and then it like bust open and there's like this evil thing that comes out of it with like two heads. It was really weird. Like what was that? I don't know. Like you when the that- monkey rides the jaguar and the tiger eats the new bile one and blah blah. blah I love blah, blah. the mo- like because the, the monkey's riding in a jaguar. The jaguar is mm-hmm. a car. The jaguar is a car. I just I thought that was the cutest thing. They're like monkey, don't ride the jaguar. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. There is a bad. lot of um, big trouble in little China in this. There's a lot of, um, oh, what was the Eddie Murphy movie at the time? The Golden Child in this. Yeah, late 80s, early 90s was kind of like a big thing when they were bringing in a lot of Asian sort of mythology into action films. And I I think Lloyd was sort of tapping into that. And, and, you know, it was serendipitous that at the same time that he was talking about the Kabuki thing, that this was also kind of happening. So it was a good way to sort of to tap into something that was kind of popular in the movies and then make a you know some money on it too of course it's just like you said namco really wanted this for a younger audience and that's just not lloyd kaufman's wheelhouse so right i mean if they wanted it i hate to say it but if they wanted it for a younger audience they should have paid um somebody else you know as somebody else but paid trauma for the idea you mm-hmm. know or something because they're doing they're doing a new toxic avenger movie with peter dinklage in, you know in the movie and i think that's amazing but i like i'm just fascinated by that because that's that's hollywood actually doing a toxic avenger movie like yeah. how crazy About is time. that gonna be you know uh i what don't know is- if it'll be great but we'll see what when is that going to be released? Because I keep hearing about that, but I'm like, I don't think real? it's been shot yet. So I don't even know. Um, I talked to Lloyd about it. You know, that's one of the questions I was asking him right before the interview. And uh, he was, or maybe it was during the interview, but I remember asking him that question and he was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> nobody tells him anything. They just, they just basically give him money for this, you know, and everything. So understandably, he's, he's okay with that because, I think he's at the point right now where he's he's made most of everything he wants to to keep making and uh now if somebody wants to buy his property you know sure you know as long as you make it um right. he did have an issue with them trying to make a toxic crusaders tv uh or movie you know based on the thing and that was new line actually uh stole uh the movie away from um, mm-hmm. like the stuff, like they bought the rights to the, to the stuff, but, uh, ended up, uh, just sitting on it because it would have, uh, interfered with, uh, was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles three. They were using that as leverage to mm-hmm. get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles three made, which I think is so messed up because they're, they were similar cartoons, like competing cartoons. Well, so. from what I understand, there is a PG 13 cut of this film. Yes. I don't know if they made that he specifically had that re-edited for the Namco people or not. I have never seen it, but I did hear that it was out there. So it is out there. Uh, he did screen it for those people, and they all hated it. <laughs> um, yeah, because it just didn't make any sense. Like all those, all the stuff that was probably any good was sort of cut out of it, and it was just didn't like think thing you know things didn't connect and everything and it yeah, just all didn't the feel boobs good. all the rape stuff all the explicit gore and probably joe fleischler eating all the donuts maybe i like joe like i was <laughs> friends with joe Fleischaker back in the myspace days yeah. yeah it was a while back you know and uh shame he passed on i i would have loved to work with him if he hadn't if he hadn't passed on um he was such a great person he wanted me to work with him but it just didn't didn't happen oh and dude, Brick Bronski 
died. I had no idea. Yeah. He was the guy who played Jughead. He died of COVID of all things. My goodness. Do you remember I, Jughead, um, Jessa? He was the big blonde bricky guy. No, what is isn't that um like like Archie? Betty? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's from yeah. Archie and Veronica, but it's like there's I guess he's just a jughead. Yeah, he's yeah. he's like he's the tough guy with the bad teeth, and every time, you know, he's like really super tough at first but then he gets beaten up or gets kicked in the nards by kabuki man so after that he's always like oh my god he's gonna turn into that guy in the in the, the pajamas oh. yeah the other guy was scarier though the long-haired well wig oh, guy Rembrandt. Rembrandt. He kind of really familiar didn't he he kind of did um i wasn't sure who he who he was i don't think he was a, i don't think he was a big name or anything no. so mm -hmm. You know, but Thomas Chernikovich, uh, and I, I don't know anything about him. He passed away too. So oh, there's the, yeah, there's That's a such few a shame. Folks. Yeah. Um, but he luckily, was in Dorm Days too, just so uh, you know. Well, we'll eventually get to Dorm. We have to do Dorm Days one first, you know, mm -hmm. eventually. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, the, the main guy, the guy who played, um, Rick uh, Gia, Giannassi, I think that's how you right. say his name. Uh, he uh, he was an actor who, because they actually had money, you know, and they could afford whatever to have like real auditions, and they actually put him like through thirteen or fourteen auditions, and oh he my was God. just yeah. yeah. He, well, back then that's what they really did. They don't do it as much anymore, you 13? know. Yeah, yeah. sometimes oh people. That's what people did. That you know. Um, and I he think, was in Robot Holocaust. Woohoo! He was also a mutant uh, hunt. Um, yeah. So he had see that was a, a main thing of why they cast him was because he had a name already in a way. Like he wasn't some guy off the street who had never acted before or whatever. And he you know? ended up on Star Trek Voyager too. What was that, Jessa? Which character are you talking about? Oh, the main guy, the Kabuki man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he had he had done a bunch of different stuff. So yeah, he had gone through thirteen or fourteen auditions. He got the role, and he was perfect. Like yeah. as you said, he was an idiot, you know. And that's literally what he had to be, you know. Yeah, like he was very was... over the top, but that's pretty much what the character required. Exactly. Yeah. Well, especially when he was Kabuki Man, he was way over the top. <laughs> you know? And I love that. I actually uh, showed my dad that uh scene with uh uh in the park where he just come becomes kabuki man it is to me it is by by far probably one of the best scenes trauma has ever done you know I, I he like changed into a cocoon like a balloon and then on the inside of the cocoon like he turns into kabuki man and you see him like going through it i was like how did they come up with that idea like uh, it was uh, well. The script was written by Lloyd Kaufman, uh, Andrew Osborne, and um, uh, who's the other? Uh, Jeffrey Sass. Now Jeffrey was an older gentleman at the time, like whatever, like probably Lloyd's age, you know. And Andrew was much younger. And Andrew was the guy who was all like, "Let's put in all the rape and all the you know all the other stuff in there, like the the." you know the the bad stuff or whatever let's let's go extreme and jeffrey was the guy that's just like no oh, let's not go too too extreme wow. um there was one scene where they were gonna have he like lloyd kaufman wanted to have a scene where a um it was like a something got turned into a snake right uh i forgot what it was like a uh you know somebody's cane or something got turned into a snake and then crawled up somebody's butt and then went out their mouth. <laughs> nice. And they said no. Like, everybody said no. And the Lee guy even said, no, I don't, please don't put that in there because that's just going to ruin the movie. And he, to this day, it, it didn't get made. Uh, but there was uh, there was another scene that got shot that they were, oh, the the scene where he turned the, the uh, prostitute and the hook or the prostitute and the uh the pimp into sushi you know hey. cut them all up what i love i love that i was like that's so funny like all I, his um all of his like weapons were great like i really liked 
uh, the chopsticks where he threw the chopsticks at the bad guy and then he got pinned to the tree mm -hmm. and he had chopsticks all over him. I was like, that's pretty fun because it's so stupid. <laughs> like, I was like, your weapons are terrible. Whenever he fit, <laughs> first picked that sword and he was like, this is a sword from such and such and such. And it was made by such and such. I thought he was going to get that really cool sword as like, a weapon like maybe that guy was gonna gift it to him or something but no it's like chopsticks fans <laughs> like uh, a little yeah. like little um oriental umbrella um all of that stuff i'm like this is that's the those are the lamest <laughs> like weapons you possibly can have but they worked i loved it it was a little bit of uh killer clowns from outer space kind of weaponry there i thought that was cute too yeah what was, was that into the clown yeah, so go into that, Paul. You were just talking yeah. about how you love that scene. I love that because clearly he was not completely up on his training. So he goes in there fully expecting to turn himself into Kabuki Man, and he turns himself into a fat, waddling clown. And all of his <laughs> weapons are, are clown weapons instead. And, of course, he's got to run away. And then he steals the kid's trike, and the, he goes through that whole thing. But I, I remember the very first time I saw that and he remember he, he he takes the trike from the kid and he pulls out his badge and he shows it to him. And there's instead of his regular badge, it's him as a clown and it's got like all kinds of clown stuff on there. And I'm like, dude, clown cop. Why didn't somebody make a movie called Clown Cop? That would have been great. Everybody would have loved that. Why haven't anybody made that yet? You know, it still hasn't been made, as far as I know. We need to make Clown <laughs> Cop. Uh, but the problem is, I mean, would people think of this, maybe, when they, you know, oh, like... Oh, that's great. That's even better. Uh, <laughs> maybe we, it could get distributed by Troma, you know? Um, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, th yeah, I mean, and I know at one point he wanted to do uh, Sergeant Kabuki Man LAPD that was going to be next, and everything is going to be... I guess Sergeant Kabuki Man going to um, Los Angeles and fighting crime, you know, and everything. Um, I'm kind of glad they didn't do that. Um, I was hoping for like a uh, Toxic Avenger and and Sergeant Kabuki Man mashup Mash slash yeah. or, or versus or something, you know. Even though they're both kind of good people, good, you know, heroes, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could figure out a way to make them first, but and he still never did really that. And really the two flagship characters of the Troma uh, Entertainment Group anyway. So, you know, yeah. And, and I'm sure since uh, uh, Lloyd uh, has control over those two characters, he can do whatever he wants with them. So why not? Exactly. Um, another thing with the production <laughs> was that this production, uh, like usually Lloyd and them are like the first ones on set, you know, and everything Lloyd and, uh, cause it was co-directed by Michael hers. Um, and so usually they're the first ones on set this time. They actually had their own call time and it was an hour after the crew got on set, you know, so they weren't yes. the first ones on set. So they didn't have to do as much, which was n actually kind of makes this movie a, a, a little bit better for the sense that like, I like. I feel like a lot of his movies, Lloyd is like doing everything, so it sort of hinders his chances to just concentrate and focus on the stuff that needs to get done. You know, mm -hmm. mainly uh, just and, direction. And I'm glad you you pointed that out because I did notice a, a few continuity <laughs> issues that I think might not have you know happened in some of those smaller productions just because there was a lot more going on so for example um early on in the scene when the when the guy who was supposed to be kabuki man gets killed and they throw his wife or his girlfriend whatever it was out the window you notice the window initially is a single plane of glass but when she's going through it it's divided into four mm -hmm. and then it's yeah so that's like okay that's that's well, a thing it looked like it looked like if you looked outside, because I, I saw it kind of twice, you know, but if you look outside, it looked like it was a painted uh, background. So it wasn't even really like maybe it was a set that she was yeah. getting so thrown that, out of that, and the that, building that was. And then like in the clown scene, clearly when he turns into the clown first, he's kind of a big 
puffy clown. But then during the chase, he gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time he's on the unicycle, he's like a regular sized dude. You know, well, I think for that, because I, I noticed that, too. I think the reason is because Safety. with something that you would you would catch air. So you yeah. couldn't like ride a tricycle very well. And especially yeah. not a unicycle, just knock over. But do you yes. think it was double riding this unicycle? Because I can't ride a unicycle. Yeah, Can I'm you? almost positive. They hired somebody specifically for that. And then, of course, yeah. when, he, when the character gets off and, he, and they're you know, talking with him again at a police station, he's back to being the big, fat, inflated clown. I did notice that, too, yeah. So, Paul, you want to hear a funny thing about your uh, about him, the, about the girl falling out of the uh, uh, window is that they actually are about to shoot it, right? They're about to shoot her, her falling out of the window. And as she is, uh, or the guy, the stunt guy is about to go do it, right? They realize he had a beard. He didn't shave his beard. And they <laughs> could catch it on the camera. And they're like, no, 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 no. You got to go shave and everything. So that we, you know, so there's there's little there's, things like that. There's that, some continuity. That's there's good. some continuity. But, like, it's just because they're just, you know, whatever. Um, and Paul and Jess, I think you would both like this, get a kick out of this. And this story, but apparently there was a guy on set that was from like a um, uh, Islam um, communications group or whatever that wanted to make sure that there was diversity in the uh, crew. And he had actually said he had just shut down a Sidney Lumet movie. So I wonder Ooh. what movie that was, but he, because they didn't have enough diverse people. It wasn't well, at first City, that was already done. Lloyd was pissed. It was like, you're not shutting down our, our, our thing. you're not coming in here and threatening us you know blah 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 and then eventually people started coming in and going i'm black i'm black i'm black i'm asian you know i'm you know native american everybody was like in the crew and or in the crew were different um <clears throat> in diversity you know uh were very diverse and a lot of them were women like half of them were women and he uh the guy was like this is the best set i've ever been on you know, like, I'm going to go tell people about you. And you know? I'm going to say this, too. That's pretty typical of most trauma productions, especially when they do it in New York City. He said that um, there's a reason for that, actually. And he said because a lot of people in Hollywood do not hire women and they do not hire uh, people yes. of color for these crew members, these, these crew things. And these guys are amazing. And they would be should be getting like this much money, but now they have to work on trauma, you know, and everything. And they're happy just to be working and doing this stuff. So they're happy to work with them. They're happy to have top tier people working and doing their jobs. So, yep. I mean, I, I that, love that. Is that something that's going on now? Like still? Um, not as much now. Oh, things yeah, have it's changed. Not so much of an issue. It's it's changed over the years, but back in the eighties, I mean, it was definitely something that you noticed, and it was definitely something that um, one of the reasons why I I loved and and supported Troma because they were like that. They were they were like that back in the eighties. So yeah, That's good for them. I feel like back in the eighties, probably no one was on top of that kind of thing as as well as they are now now i mean they have to kind of pay attention to that you know but back then they actually had somebody that was checking it out that's interesting yeah, yeah and the I thing mean, is i mean he was you know they were the little company that that was fighting against all the big ones at the time you know so they were always trying to make their mark anyway so i mean toxy kind of put them on the on the the, the big screen in a way that they hadn't really done before and after that they were able to run and and do more stuff and you know it um, was always great so the guy that got hired as the bad guy the uh was it the corporate guy you know and everything uh who's the evil who ends up being the evil one at the end and everything he oh, was played Stewart. yeah he was played by bill whedon bill who whedon. they cast him because he looks just like jack valenti <laughs> uh, who is the head of uh, the who at the time was the head of the MPAA and uh, so he was the, he was what Troma feels is the evil corporation that screws over the indie people you know right. because the MPAA in fact they even screwed this over um, they were going to market the PG-13 version 
but they couldn't because they would have had to pay another extra whatever just to get that approved. So they just did the R rated. That is the only reason why you see the um, uh, now, I guess they could still release it. It would just be unrated. You know, nowadays it's much easier mm -hmm. to put stuff out, you know, and you just say unrated and you don't have the MPAA look at it, you know. And the funny thing is, is that that's Bill Whedon's first real role. And then he's got like a billion things after that. So mm -hmm. Sergeant Kabuki man kind of made his career. I actually just added him as a friend on Facebook and he Yay. accepted um, I love that because he uh, we, we got to get him on Indie Film Cafe. We got to get him to talk about this movie. Oh, yeah. Like uh, oh, yeah. for uh, the spotlight. Um, I'd love to. He, he was in uh, Citizen Toxie and I think a few other. Um, uh, few he other, was great uh, in this. Uh, do oh, you remember yeah. him, uh, Jessa, the, the big, ba the blonde bat guy or gray haired, I guess? Or Yeah, that was going to ask. Do you think was it his hair naturally gray or did he color it gray? Because his eyebrows are so dark. The pictures I've ever seen of him has always been sort of that whitish gray. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe for this one, now. he was he was younger then. So maybe I don't know. Um, hmm. I know he worked with uh, Michael Rappaport, you know, and stuff, which was the uh, was Michael Saint Michael or whatever, and the Greasy Strangler. Yeah, so he got to work with him and stuff. So. You know, they, those two kind of look similar too now. Yeah, especially you know? with the long hair, the long whitish hair. Yeah, um, but I, I love that. Like, uh, I absolutely, uh, I loved his character. I loved everybody in this movie. Um, there was no like this is. I, I always said Troma's War is was my favorite. You know, of like the sort of lesser known uh, ones, but I might. I don't know. I have to rewatch Troma's War, which I also bought on Blu-ray, and uh, and compare. But I mean, this is a this is a high marking for me, which kind of surprising in a way. Like I kind of wasn't sure. I thought it would still be goofy and fun, but I, I didn't think it would get the feeling that I got when I watched it. And like I I in, literally enjoyed watching it. I wanted to almost watch it again, like right after. And not many movies these days actually make me feel that way, you know? So that's a, that's a big thing for me. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much had the same reaction that I did the last time I saw this movie, which must've been at least a decade ago. Cause it's, it's been so wild, been a while. I always think it's fun. I always, you know, enjoy the fact that it's just a ridiculous over the top cartoon. Mm -hmm. I always kind of in the back of my mind say, well, I do kind of wish Lloyd had shown a little restraint and me, you know, maybe taking a few things a little more seriously, and some of it's a little too over the top. And that's that's me talking. But um, like, what, like what though? For example, um, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I I guess I guess some of the uh, I, I wish some of the like some of the change scenes they all seem to be different. You know, whenever he was changing it, it didn't it always seemed to be kind of different so it would have been nice if it had been sort of the same i mean i'd like the cocoon thing too but i don't think that pops up ever again uh, are you, you saying know? him changing into yeah, the man? Like we well i, I the think the first time because... the camera just goes in a circle well i think <laughs> this is the, because it's the first time he's doing it it's the reveal i think each time he's getting better and better and learning like training whatever so things are sort of different each time you know remember you said he even turned into the clown and so because he wasn't completely, you know, ready for his training, you know, or whatever. So I, I think each time it's like a different thing because he's sort of a different, you know, uh, person. He's kind of growing and maturing uh, his character, you know. Um, but I, I know I don't I didn't mind the changing. I mean, some of the silliness of his, you know, overacting and everything. Yeah, may have been needed to calm down. But it was supposed to be a live action cartoon. Right, right. It makes and, sense. You know, it, it's it's a tiny bit cringy to have some of the, the, the rape in there with the cartoon because usually you don't have, you know what I mean? Usually you're going to have that in something a lot more serious. So to have it in a, in a more broad comedy, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to say you can't have it or it's bad. I'm just saying I, it made me feel a little, a little cringy. Just a little. Are you talking? about the scene in the park yeah the oh, rape scene. I, I don't think i 
I didn't consider that rape. Like I know they were like pulling her clothes off and stuff, but like I thought they were just trying to um like like humiliate her. Like I didn't think that it was like I don't know, maybe I missed it. Like maybe yeah. I totally it, but I I don't I didn't think they were actually like penetrating her or one, anything. One of the guys definitely was when they oh, had oh, Okay, that sucks. Yeah. I hate these. Yeah. I'm glad I missed that. Yeah. I'm glad you, <laughs> you know missed that too. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to use something like that in a comedy, no matter how broad it is, without it affecting the tone of the rest of the movie. So that that always was kind of like, you know, uh I, I I thought so too. And I sort of didn't like um I, I didn't like the nudity and the and, and that stuff because as far as like because I, I felt like this should have been marketed toward kids, like for kids sort of thing. You know, Lloyd is not that kind of way. Like he doesn't, he doesn't like that. It's kind of like you, Paul, you know, like, oh, I, I know. Can, you know, I think that's why you like trauma a lot because it's like sort of against, you know, uh, conventional nature, you know, and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so like, I, I almost feel like it would have been interesting to see him do a full on cartoon, you know, a live action cartoon where it was sort of because even Rick was talking to to Lloyd about it and said that, um, you know, uh, kids were coming up and playing with Kabuki Man and they liked him. They kept chanting Kabuki Man, Kabuki Man. They, they like this. They can't watch this. I would not show well, it like a child. This. And that's the interesting thing, because you're right in this country. And in most of the West, you can't. But in Japan, you can. And in a lot of places in Asia, they don't have the same restrictions for kids that we do over here, which is why you see a lot of crazy shit in some of their kids-related movies. Right. But even then, the the Namco and all of them did not like yeah. this. They knew where the stuff. market was. The market was America. Yeah. So there you go. I just it would have been cool to see it marketed toward kids and that uh, they would have, if this had done really well enough, they would have um, uh, had the cartoon. It would have done just, it's funny because toxic crusaders was based on toxic Avenger. Toxic Avenger was an R rated movie, oh, you yeah. know? So I guess they could have made Sergeant Kabuki man, but uh, mm -hmm. as a cartoon and kept it, you know, and, but... and that's, that's kind of perfect because toxic Avenger, has a lot of similarities as far as as far as tone goes where you've got stuff that normally would be very very serious mixed up with broad broad comedy but it's more effective in my opinion in toxic avenger than it is in this one um and it's really really difficult that's a really tough tightrope to to walk and it's i can imagine you know it's it's just not easy um it was still yeah. fun it was still good i still like it um, I was talking to Steve Rosinski yesterday. I had him on my show and uh, mentioned oh, this. Cool. And actually, Steve loves this movie because of its toned downness. Because mm -hmm. he feels like Lloyd works better when he's, you know, toned down, you know, or whatever, and kind of controlled res con restraint, you know. And I kind of agree. Like, I I feel like maybe more movies. Like, could you imagine sort of poultry guys being sort of more pushed? Like, like it would have been interesting, you know, to see more restraint toward things, at least a different cut of it, you know? Well, yeah, but I mean, poultry guys is a lot more of a, of a comedy. You know what I mean? There aren't a whole lot of, of darker, dramatic things you have to worry about that. So, I don't know. I, I like poultry guys kind of the way it is, but I can understand in a movie like this, Simply because, like I said, you're you're trying to balance several different kinds of tones, and if you go over too much in any one direction, it's just it's not going to work. You know, fortunately, mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't go too crazy or too restrained or too dark or too comedic. But there is definitely parts that I kind of wish had been a little bit more balanced and a little bit more nuanced. And I always kind of feel like that when I when I watch the movie. But it's you know overall, I still like it. Yeah. Uh, overall, did you enjoy it, Jessa? I did. Yeah, I had a good time with it. I thought like it was one of like out of all of the other trauma movies that I've seen, 
like you said, like it, it definitely, you could tell that there was a higher bar as far as like the budget goes, like it was cleaner in that way. Um, and I thought the acting was actually damn good, like really, really good. Um, and I liked their, their like the edits, like whenever they would go from one scene to another, like sometimes it would go like zoom in and then zoom out or it would spin or whatever. Like I was like, I like those old school kind of like edits, like that's so cool. Mm -hmm. But no, I had a really good time with it. I really enjoyed the like the journey of the, you know, superhero. And I like the little um, girlfriend that he got and all of that. Like, I just thought it was fun. Like, it was a lot of fun. And talk a little bit about the costumes and makeup, because there was a lot more of that going on. And then again, in most of your your trauma films, too. Oh, for sure. Like, I wondered how many times they would have to paint his face. Like, I think you guys mentioned that in some, like at the very beginning, in some of the scenes, it was all of makeup, like mm -hmm. that he was wearing as Sergeant Kabuki Man. Um, but then it started to be where it was like a mask where only the eyes and the chin and the mouth were exposed. So I wonder if like that was like a conscious decision or if it was like, this will be quicker <laughs> to do. Like we could like, only like make up his eyes and his chin and his mouth and just put this mask on and that'll be a lot quicker. Or if it was like, that was always planned out like that. Well, I noticed that he seemed to have the mask more when there was about to be action. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it was probably, it was probably more effective and more, you know, it was probably just better and easier to have him with the mask on when he's moving around and, you know, stuff could get shaken up. Whereas close-ups, you know, or things where there, there's not a lot of action going on, it was more makeup. I that's what I thought, but I I could be wrong. Now, um, what is it? Uh, what is it? Um, uh, Toxic Avenger is a mask, you know, mm -hmm. that he wears most of the time or whatever. They don't do makeup for him. They, I think, they might put some makeup stuff on it or whatever, but it's a mask, and it's a mask for one big reason too, is because Lloyd has always sort of said. If the person doesn't show up, they can always put somebody else in the in the in the uh, mask, right. you know. And he's been very, you know, he's he's almost fired a certain toxic Avengers because they showed up late or whatever, and he's threatened, "I'll just replace you, you know, with this person over here, a stump person, you know, or whatever." And so I think he might have done that with Sergeant Kabuki Man too, because, you know, if you look at um. Uh, Doug uh, Sackman and and uh, Zafir Zaluku, I think I don't know how you say his name. Uh, they both have um, uh, been Toxic Avenger and Sergeant Kabuki Man back in the day of going to the trauma conventions, and I think they could sometimes they might even swap places, you know, or whatever, because it doesn't really matter who's behind that mask, you know. Like yeah. I mean sort of does i guess when it comes to the talking and stuff but when it comes to a lot of like walking around and everything anybody could be in that mask and it, you know or whatever um so i i think it is sort of both maybe some of the some close-ups they do uh makeup and and everything so that uh it doesn't look like a mask you know but then sometimes it's got to be a mask sometimes like even the one you're wearing right now you have right now behind you uh paul mm -hmm. that almost looks very much like oh yeah mask, yeah you know? definitely definitely and that and he's about to fight so that's that's one way you know you yeah know? so like yeah because it it could be where you know the makeup would get smeared or messed up and they'd have to continuity they would have to make sure like everybody you know like all that's taken care of so right right, right. i don't know um uh real uh what it, i did want to mention something um you know I'll, I'll get back to whatever uh was there anything else paul that you sort of were thinking about because you asked uh, jessa about the the thing um jessa what did you think about the um the writing of the film did you think it was really well written i thought it was pretty well written written yeah like um i really like i said enjoyed the storyline and uh i think like just coming up with like some of the creative things like the cocoon like how he did the cocoon like bubble thing of like robe and changed into kabuki, kabuki man like i thought all that stuff was like how do you come up with that like 
I've always like kind of wanted to write a script and I'm just like, how does one even like, where do you go in your mind to find some of these ideas? You but, just go, you know, honestly, uh, <laughs> that's, that's how I am. It's just, you start just thinking and thinking and then eventually, and with him, he had a, uh, he would do things differently than I do. Normally what I will do is I'll have, I'll write some of the stuff and I'll give it to somebody else and they'll, they'll write the other half or, or whatnot, you know, and that works sometimes and sometimes it, it doesn't work as well. Um, but um, with him, he, he actually would meet with the person and one person would be on the key, you know, keyboard typing everything out and they both come up with ideas for stuff, you know? So, you know, so maybe having a co-writer or something would be very helpful for you because then you can kind of both hone in on ideas. Or something. And I don't know about you guys, but I would love to be at a brainstorming session with Lloyd Kaufman when he's really, really got some ideas going. I can just imagine what some of his crazy ideas would be. Well, I oh. mean, what were you saying, uh, Jessa? I was saying, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got to hang out with Lloyd. I was kind of jealous. Like, you oh, got tell to, me about like, it. You got to actually have like hangout sessions with them and stuff, you know, and everything. So, I know it was work, but I mean, it was it was fun for you, I'm sure. You know, it was, it um, was a lot of. How did how did the um uh the shakes was it the um uh, hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm uh theater like the the screening go. Well, I did not stay for the entire screening. I will say that. But um, when we introduced it, we were all toasted. Like we were all <laughs> a little drunky drunk. So that I would have, I would pay to see a recording of us like just talking and like the whole time uh, Lloyd was uh, backing up and like, we were like making sure he wasn't gonna fall over because <laughs> we, we were all like a little lit, you know. Even I mean? even Lloyd, nice. Yeah. Yes, they were so. He's so fun whenever he's a little lit. That's like, <laughs> well, that's that was, good. I gotta say, meeting Lloyd Kaufman has always been a bucket list thing for me. And then finally getting to meet him there, and then meeting you too. That was just like icing on the cake. So that was that was a great a great con for me. Yeah, we were excited. I mean, there's there's there was a lot of cool people there, you know, that we were just, you know, excited. I mean, you, Rebecca, you know, uh, the the greasy strangler guy, like just all of those people, just like it was cool, it was fun. I we enjoyed it, you know, Absolutely. and stuff. So and enjoyed getting to interview like a few of these people, you know, uh, and stuff. Uh, our Lloyd Kaufman uh, interview should be coming out on Monday, which. Not this Monday on when this thing comes out and everything, because this won't be out till uh, I think March. <laughs> so it'll wow. be a little while, you know. And yeah. I've been wanting to talk to him since the '80s, since Toxic Avengers. So this this was like a big thing for me. So I was very pleased. Yeah, you get an interview with him. I mean, because we can't really get him on these shows because he's so busy, you know, yeah. like doing the zooms and stuff. So. Just to be able to sit down and actually have five, ten minutes, whatever. I think it was like ten minutes. Uh, we went a little longer and we didn't get yelled at about that, which we were very happy with because Lloyd just enjoyed talking. You know, I think oh, he would have. Like, I definitely, I found out so many interesting things just listening to him talk to other people, like about his life and how he got into film and all of that. Um, but yeah, he loves to talk. Like. I think he, he, he kind of like referred to himself as a narcissist a few times. And I thought that was so funny. Like, I was like, mm -hmm. I love that you're like self-aware, like enough to know that you love to be heard and you love to talk to people and like, just get out there and like really get to know people. And he was just so gracious with everybody. Honestly, I wish I would have maybe talked to him more, but I think I, I was honestly starstruck the whole weekend. Like, and I usually don't feel that way at all, but like, He's just such an amazing person. And like ever since I started, uh, you know, since I saw some trauma films, like back whenever I was in, like, in high school, because I, I dated a guy that just all of a sudden got into trauma. So he was like, buying. all of a sudden, <laughs> like, yeah, like, all of a sudden got into trauma. And he was like, I want to make independent films. He never did. But, um, you know, we watched him and I was like, oh, my God, like I wanted to be a trauma so bad. Like, I mean, it was like, to me, that was like the dream. And I was like, I can never do that. Like, I just live in the middle of nowhere. Like, I'll never be able to like meet this like cool guy that's been so creative 
And then to be able to actually like, I've been in like a trauma movie now with a very small part, you know, now I've been like a super trauma at like at a con, like with Lloyd. It's just amazing. It's, it's a total, like if I could see myself back whenever I was like in high school now, like in who I am, I think I would be so excited. Like I'd be jumping up and down like, oh my God, I'm going to be so cool. You know, like, I but think I mean, Lloyd that's is just amazing. yeah that 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 is amazing and i think that's a lot of indie filmmakers and actors mm -hmm. you know just yeah. like you like i feel like so many of them dreamed of of like you know um i, I think because of conventions and and the way people are these days how mm -hmm. easily it is to just meet people you know um completely different than what it was like in the 80s and 90s you know like it was harder back then you know though i will say the 90s i got really jealous that uh my buddy vincent Pereira told me that apparently he got to hang out with like sam raimi and bruce campbell before at the one of the conventions just when they were just chilling nice. you know at conventions and i was just like what like, we're you know like i wish i was doing that back then you know right, right. i didn't get into it until 2010 is i i did want to point out um michael hers is also a co-director and he's mm -hmm. been he's been lloyd's partner in crime for forever and he's you know responsible for a lot of the success for trauma too and he doesn't get quite the accolades because he's he's kind of the opposite of, of lloyd because lloyd is so gregarious and outgoing and extroverted and fun and funny and all that and michael's the opposite he's he's very quiet he has no interest in really being the face of trauma and, and doing all the publicity stuff. He has no interest in that. In fact, as I recall, uh, Joe Fleischler, he, I mean, he, Fleischaker, yeah, yeah Fleischaker, he kind of played Michael Hertz a few times, as I recall. Which is funny because he looks nothing like Michael Hertz. Yeah, he looks nothing like him. Because so, so Joe funny. Fleischaker is a big, big, was a big, yeah. big guy. And, uh, and Michael is actually, if you've ever seen pictures of Michael, Michael's very skinny. Uh, I mean, he doesn't, he, he looks normal in a way, in the sense of like, not somebody that you would think of like, oh, this guy's the co-director of Sergeant Kabuki, man. You think Lloyd and you're like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense right. about that guy. Right. But, you know, cause Lloyd is so out there and so crazy kind of looks, uh, my dad confused him with uh, Mel Brooks and I'm like, I get that. He made a you lot know. of jokes yeah. during the con yeah. about looks like mel brooks like and then i didn't realize he really kind of does <laughs> yeah wow. but those those two have been together for well forever as far as i know as far as like from way back in the beginning and um they they've clearly been able to work together and you know this this is a perfect example um so yeah it's it's great so i just want to make sure that uh he got some accolades as well because he usually kind of gets forgotten yeah um i they work really well on everything you know because like he worked with them on like i think most of the movies as co-director mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um and he usually is the silent one so he's usually often, the business guy i often wonder if you know lloyd's kind of the one going oh no we can do this we can do this would it be great if we did this and michael's like no 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 oh yeah let's let's not <laughs> let's gotta go crazy he was the um, one who convinced uh lloyd to change the story originally it was going to be about a college student who drank beer hit on chicks and saved the world you know like he was going to become kabuki man was going to be just a college guy Sounds and he like was kabuki and then, bro. yeah exactly kabuki bro <laughs> there you go there's there's a <laughs> sequel in there somewhere um but uh no it was um but he ended up saying let's make him a cop you know, Michael said that because we don't want to do we don't want to do Toxic Avenger 2, you know, another 2.0, whatever. We don't want to keep doing the same thing. We want to do something different. And we haven't done a cop and we haven't done somebody older, you know, you know, or whatever. So let's let's do that. And uh, Lloyd was like, OK, sure. You know, like that that would be fun. And it actually got me thinking, like, I actually really do like, mm -hmm. um, you know, cop movies, cop silly cop movies or whatever there's a bunch of them but there's you know you were saying clown cop which sounds amazing if somebody makes that that's great if it's us awesome but yes. if not somebody else um 
but there's, you know, I, it was a ninja cop, you know, or whatever, samurai cop. There's a ton of different things. So um, sure. I, I, I love that he's a kabuki cop. Maybe that could have <laughs> been a title too, kabuki cop, you know, yeah, but yeah, yeah. kabuki man, NYPD, uh, Sergeant Kabuki man, NYPD. And what did you guys think of the theme song? Did you guys hear that at the end, like the credits? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that Sorry. was fun. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was cute. Um, They had their own theme song. And if you watch the cartoon, the clips that I posted that have the cartoon on on YouTube, they, you know, they have a little bit of that song. And then they also have clips where, like, they're just silly, like, uh, kabuki puns and stuff mm. or whatever you know um sushi and stuff you know and, and things i just thought that was so it, this movie should have gotten way more way bigger than it did you know it, it should be there should be sergeant kabuki man <laughs> lunch boxes you know and, and uh bless you and coloring books and and you know everything like there should have been so much merchandising for this maybe they still could i guess if tromo wanted to market like that but you know i guess they sort of missed the boat with the big big stuff you know or whatever because it went sort of went off the rails you know would hmm. have little parts where people little kids and those were his little kids by the way lloyd's little yeah. kids i'm not sure which ones uh but i did sort of have charlotte on one of my shows before charlotte kaufman kind of mentioned that to to lloyd and lloyd lloyd was happy he uh he loves his daughters so much and mm -hmm. he probably talked about them a lot uh when he was at the convention um he did bring them up a lot so yeah. where which kids were they at the very beginning yeah so the ones that got killed uh yeah by, yeah they were like hey, you know all of a sudden, you know and i was yeah, like the, oh the man blonde ones yeah I was surprised, uh, like, I was happy that they didn't show it, you know? Yeah. It just sort of yeah. cut, you know? But I think that was probably, I, from what I understand, that his wife used to kind of yell at him about, like, using the kids and being very careful with using his kids in the, in the stuff. And Charlotte's more of the one who's, like, really big in the um, film stuff or whatever. I think maybe a couple of the other ones do stuff, but, like, Charlotte was the one who like was a director and, and went went into the father's footsteps and stuff. Um worked on like poultry geist and other stuff, you know. Hey. Uh yeah, that's how I how I ended up getting her on my show was she was or her best friend was mm -hmm. dating uh you know somebody who came on my show. So he was like, hey I could get Charlotte to call in if you if you want. And I was like uh yeah <laughs> i mean that would that would be fantastic i would love to because i knew exactly who charlotte kaufman was so i was like all right she called in for like five minutes just chatted with us and then said she had to go back to getting some stuff done i was like I mean, no problem but just having her call in and say hey like that was awesome you know nice. kind of miss so having like live shows where people just do random you know just pop in and stuff it doesn't so really happen as much Jess, have you seen Poultry Geist? I was um, being silent about it because I have not seen it. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, you definitely need to see Poultry Geist. I it's it's tell me that I would love it because I love musicals and I love comedies. So I think I would. Probably this, is, this is one where I think Michael Hurst kind of let <laughs> Lloyd kind of go and do his thing because. It's a little on the over over the top in some stuff, but it's fun. I uh, I still need to see both of the return to. I think I've seen the first return to uh, Newcomb High, but uh, I haven't seen the second one because when I first watched it, the second one, Volume Two, hadn't come out, so I just haven't watched. I haven't and, seen it either. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're on Tubi or not. Sergeant Kabuki Man is on Tubi, and that is actually new. Because for the longest time, Troma did not put their stuff on Tubi because uh, of uh, Troma Now um, mm. and everything. Where I would suggest, if you're a big Troma fan, mm. that five dollars a month, you know, and you get more than just Troma. Actually, some uh, are, you know, we we met uh, met up with Gordy Gordy Price, who um, 
did a couple movies and a couple of them are going to trauma now, you know, and stuff. So good, good. Mm. you know, um, let's not, let's not forget. Sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Jess. Oh, I was just saying that I've seen a lot of people in my feed on Facebook get their movies on trauma now recently. And I'm like, that's so awesome. That's like a built in audience that already is like a big fan of independent movies. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to point out for those of us who love to collect the physical medium that a lot of these great trauma movies are coming out in Blu-ray as well. So mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. I mean, I, we both bought, Paul and I both bought like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two different, uh, you know, uh, Blu-rays. I bought Sergeant Kabuki Man and Troma's War, which are two of my favorites. Like I love Toxic Avenger and I love Class of Newcomb High and and whatnot, Poltergeist and all that other stuff. But mm -hmm. I mean, those two and Tromeo and Juliet are just my favorite movies yeah. that Lloyd's ever put his hands on and everything and done because they mm -hmm. are just to me they're just fun and they're just enjoyable um and we've already done tromeo and juliet so eventually we'll probably do poltergeist and we'll do uh um we'll eventually do uh Troma's war as well and of course trauma war is or sorry tromeo and juliet is where they had, she gets dressed up as a cow so you know i love that yeah jen didn't love it as much as we did but <clears throat> yeah, yeah yeah it's funny it's funny that like because we do our ranking which we'll do in a little bit but we do our ranking, our rating system and stuff. And some people don't really like trauma as much as others. And so if we get somebody who doesn't love trauma as like, Jess, I know you do love trauma, but there are some yep. people out there that probably this isn't their cup of tea. And if you get them on there, they're going to say a different kind of stink thing score than yeah. we would, you know. Troma does step over a few lines that a lot of your standard Hollywood movies aren't going to do. Yeah. Which is fine. That's one reason why I love them. <laughs> well, with that being said, actually, I think that's a good segue into our stinkometer score. Now, Jess, you've been on this show. I think you've been on mm -hmm. Indie Film Cafe once with yes. us before where we, oh man, uh, Paul tortured you with a, with the, what was the one the vampire last vampire on earth oh my goodness yeah <laughs> she's like that i was, forgot about that one i wasn't that good <laughs> no that's completely different than this mm -hmm. one i'm always i'm well i'm not always but i'm sort of mostly the nicer mm -hmm. one because paul likes to paul likes to get up the stinkometer scores up a little bit so he likes to likes to sort of stink stuff up I, like i'm smelly i don't i i ch typically like to watch movies i enjoy watching you know and sergeant kabuki man was a movie i really enjoyed like sitting down and watching so um but anyway uh paul explain to us and the viewers and listeners at home or viewers at home, whatever <laughs> you want to call them uh about the stinkometer and all the ships at sea yeah so we uh we score our movies using the Three scores from the three reviewers, uh, score one to ten, by which the lower the number, the better the film is. So if you thought the movie was really, really good and didn't have any problems or anything, you would give it a one or a two. If you thought the movie was kind of meh, kind of in between, you might give it a five or five and a half because you can go a half step. And if you thought that the movie was, was terrible, you would give it a much higher score. And if you thought it was really bad and had a lot of problems, you would give it a ten. And or a 10 then, plus even. or a 10 yeah we haven't had we've only had one or two no, in, yeah two we got shark exorcist you know and gun, and some gun episodes you've only had two no. um, but yeah so we we total up our our scores and then we see you know we put them on the ladder of stink and then we figure out which movies were the worst of the year and which ones have ascended to stinky heaven yeah <laughs> there you go and and that sometimes that's an honor for us like we you know we that's generally like a lot of times mm. we enjoy we enjoy how bad the movie is you know or whatever because right. we didn't enjoy how bad it is we, we sometimes don't give it the 10 because we don't think it deserves it you know like in a way but uh i don't know i, I have this feeling this is going to be a low score um that's my that's my feeling but that does not mean that somebody has to change their feeling so um, we usually let our guests go first if they want to. Um, Jess, would you like to uh, tell us what your score would be? I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do um, 
I think it's a four. A four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we ask for a reason, but if you don't want to like, say why, you uh, would give it a four. I mean, it was really enjoyable. It was just like probably not a movie I would choose. Like, I wanted more gross stuff because it was, like, trauma. But everything was everything was solid. So I think four is a solid number. Like, everything was solid. Uh, the storyline was solid. The costuming was actually really good. Um, there's so many things about it that I really enjoyed. The actors were really good. Even, you know, some of, like, the small parts that people got. Like, I would love to say, like, I was, like, the guy that had the laundry shop that the car crashed into. Like, and I came out, like, re- you remember that part where they're, mm-hmm. like, crashing into the show? Like, I was, I was like, I, all the parts, like, all the different actors were so good. But um, I would just give it a four instead of a three because it wouldn't be something I would normally choose. Right. I, I love the fact that you said that uh, you wish that it was grosser. And I'm like, you definitely got to watch Poultry Guys. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot grosser. And, like, Paul said, I think this one was – uh, he was sort of, you know, constrained on on doing. And Tromeo and Juliet has some really gross stuff too. It um, does. This, oh, well, you've seen Tromeo and Juliet. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those movies, uh, Poltergeist and Tromeo and Juliet and stuff. I think those were where Michael Hurst was probably letting Lloyd just kind of like, you know what, we we let you be constrained on the last one. Let's let's let you do it, whatever you want to do. Make your movie. And <laughs> Lloyd Lloyd had a fun time, um, and I, he had a, I, as far as I know, he had a good time working on this film, you know, and everything. Um, so, Paul, what would you say? Yeah, well, and I don't know about the necessarily a good time. I, I think because of the extra pressure from Namco to do stuff, I might have made things because I understood there was some there was some tension on set from from a few things, so. I don't know. I guess that's that's a question. If I ever get a chance to talk with Lloyd again, that would be something I'd want to ask him. Um, as far as my rating goes, I, it's very similar to Jess. I'm going to probably go with a four and a half just because, you know, tone wise, like I said, I, I do wish that things had been a little bit more one or the other. Um, I, the, I'd given uh, Tromeo and Juliet a three and a half, and um, I do think that's the better film. However, it is still a good movie, and it's still better than the average independent film that we see here. So, you know, four and a half is still a fairly low r- rating for me. So, uh, yeah, and uh, overall, I, I always enjoy it. It's always fun to watch this. And it is it is one of the, the Tro movies, I will say, that um, I don't watch as often as I watch some of the other ones. Like, I'll always watch Toxic Avenger. I'm always ready for that. Um, Tromeo and Juliet, I'm always ready for that. And a couple others. Um, and poultry guys stuff. Poultry guys, definitely poultry guys. So yeah, it's not quite in that group, but it's still a good film. Okay, so it's interesting that you say that because you know you're four point five, right? Is that what you you said you went on? She's four. I'm I'm definitely see. I'm I'm more of the mainstream guy, you know, of the group probably, you know, oh, yeah. and stuff. I like I like Hollywood. I like Marvel. I like superhero stuff. This had a. Uh, there was a part where it was a parody of Batman where the, you know, the guy says, who are you? You know? And he goes, I am Kabuki man. Pokemon. And it was a parody of Batman. Cause there's a scene where in the 1989 Batman, with Tim, Tim Burton, the guy says, who are you, man? And he goes, I am Batman, you know? And so there's the, there's that parody. You could kind of tell that this was what they were trying to do was your trauma uh hollywood you know superhero movie and so it was sort of a metal mess however the stuff that you guys might not have liked and stuff of that you know and wanting it to be grosser and everything i was happy with like i enjoyed all of that stuff that stuff really kind of made me feel good inside and so this was the closest thing to being able to watch a marvel uh trauma movie you know or whatever and so i have to give it a two um it's like i said it's really high up there i'm excited to rewatch, um you know rewatch uh trauma's war because i always have viewed that as like one of my favorites so i want to rewatch that and see if it 
holds up still or if I think it's less than or whatnot. I have to look at what I gave Tromeo and Juliet, um, you know, mm -hmm. my, my stinkometer rating for that. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was higher mm -hmm. than, um, you know, uh, two. Uh, and the other thing is people have to understand, too, is that the Tromo movies that um, Lloyd and Michael make tend to be much better than the movies that they simply distribute. You know, right. so I think a lot of people, they see Troma and they see some of the other kind of crappier movies, you know, your, your Actium Maximuses and some mm -hmm. of the other ones that are out there. And they're like, oh, God, Troma's always got these cheap, crappy movies. Well, the ones that were done specifically by Lloyd and Michael uh, tend to be a lot more interesting. They tend to be a lot better. The, mm -hmm. the production is a lot better. And this is definitely one of that group. Exactly. And uh, yeah, uh, Jesse, you have not seen Actium Maximus and run. If Paul ever asks you to watch it, just, just say no, you Evil know, pancakes and syrup. Come on. No, it's just, they're just there. It's a hilarious. It's a, like a dinosaur. I, I don't know what it is like a puppets and stuff, you know, and it's just, it's terrible. Paul made me watch it. And I literally, it was the shortest indie film cafe episode we had done in a while. <laughs> Because I didn't, I didn't want he was to talk. Dumbstruck. No, I, yeah, I didn't want to talk. I just, I was like, I, I don't even want, I don't want to discuss. I want to forget about this film, you know. So it should have been a, a thirty, but unfortunately, I'm an idiot and uh, thought that there was no way Paul was going to give me a ten on the first episode back on season two. So you know, it, he did give me something that was pretty much the worst thing, one of the worst things I've ever seen. And what but, was funny is that you know. Because this is set in outer space with aliens, um, the director decided that you should not be able to understand anything. So it was all like, <laughs> like 90% of it with no subtitles. So you never well, have subtitles. Subtitles did appear. Occasionally. Okay. Yeah. But you, so. otherwise you had no idea what was going on. None. So You're anyway, different. yes, that was, and that was a trauma. Trauma put that out. Trauma didn't produce it. But they distributed the film and everything. So uh, I, I think at that point in time, trauma was just pretty much taking whatever, you know, anybody sent them, you know, and that it goes Love to it. show on that. Because, uh, like, there used to sort of be a joke, and it kind of sounds sad, but there used to be a joke about, you know, if you if you couldn't get in, you couldn't get distribution, you could at least get trauma, you know, distribution back then. But now they're very much very serious about who they take and they're very you know they're you know i think they're getting to the point where they understand that they are sort of part of the elite you know groups of you know including uh full moon who go and put out movies you know so and that was always the big dividing line between full moon and those guys i mean full moon has their own you know stinkers that they put out as well but they're not they're not it's not the same they they mm. don't really go dumpster diving for some of the cheapest crappiest stuff uh, well, no they don't do any of that they yeah. usually do mm. everything in-house so mm. you know charles band is usually a producer of it instead of just the distributor trauma was just distributing for a while so um but sergeant kabuki man and poultry guys and tromeo and juliet all those are all in-house movies and uh, some of the in-house movies are great, uh, are, are all great. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen a bad uh, one that Lloyd has directed. You know? How awesome would it be if we could get both Charles Band and Lloyd Kaufman on at the same time, having them talk about stuff? Because they both are veterans from the 80s who've been and seen everything you can think of. And I know I think they don't necessarily are best friends or anything, but you know, I think they 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 usually do um, like stuff together. They will, you know, like I think Lloyd would probably go on Charles's show or something, you know, his podcast right, and stuff go. and talk and everything. They're like they're supportive of each other, but they're they are competition. They're rivals. You know? Yeah, you think they're rivals, so they you know there's always going to be that. Uh, that little rivalry between them of like, you know, I, I've been doing this all, uh, just as long as you have. And so we, you know, whatever, but 
Uh, my, my dreams of a mashup or a crossover with, say, puppets from uh, uh, Full Moon attacking Toxic Avenger or something. I guess that's never going to happen. I never say never. I mean, you know, I don't know. You'd have to pitch that to Charles because he would, or uh, William Butler or something who's working mm -hmm. on that stuff who we got to meet. And that was so cool. Like just meeting people from Full Moon and from, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Troma, you know, at that convention. So Scarefest was awesome. I, I really, really enjoyed going out there. Sorry, Jess, what'd you say? I'm sorry. Um, I'm not familiar with Full Moon. What kind of, like, what movies? Oh, oh my goodness, Jessa, 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 Jessa. Yeah, we have to, we have to bring you down the full moon, like we have got to point. get you here to Virginia. We have so many movies to show you. Um, so Full Moon is the company they did like the Puppet Master movies. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you're 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 familiar with them. They did Evil Bong, Ginger Dead Man. They did all these weird like kind of more puppety stuff than uh, Troma does. Troma really doesn't mess around that much. This is Actium Maximus. They don't right. really mess around with puppets. Well, puppets and all that, that's expensive. So, mm -hmm. and that's the thing. So, and then once you, once you make them, well, shit, you might as well make 15 movies with the same puppets because you've already made them. Yeah. So, you know. so there you go. Yeah. So they do the puppet master movies. They're already up to like 10 or 11 or something like that of the puppet master movies and they continue to do stuff and and so much more though they do a lot of different stuff yeah you would you would like more of that stuff if you get a chance to watch it because it's it's silly and fun and you would probably fit very well in with uh the 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 cast of uh those movies because they just they make goofy funny shit just because they just enjoy making yeah. stuff. They're kind of like trauma, but with, I think they have a little grosser. bit more, a little bit more money. You yeah. Know, and less, less of the gross out stuff. Yeah. It's more, I mean, more mainstream or than, than trauma, you know, a little, bit more. a little bit more, but not, not, you know, not very Hollywood, <laughs> you know, which is good, you know, cause I mean, that's the great thing about these independent companies is they're able to, go out and crank their own movies out and everything. Thank right. God for them because without these two, I don't know where I would have been, uh, you know, in the eighties. Cause uh, yeah, it was even by the eighties. I was getting, uh, I was getting turned off by Hollywood. Yeah. So there you go. There, there had to be the companies that got to produce these uh, low budget, more fun movies. Um, anyway, we're, we're about that time. Uh, I know this is going to be, this is going to be March. That this comes out it's gonna be a while uh but uh jess have you what have you been up to lately just chilling no um i uh just being as a part of the movie scene as i possibly can um i hope that by march uh soon around march to um the beginning of summer that uh debbie does demons will be out i'm really excited about that i got to play a 300 year old witch in underwear and nice. mostly, mostly topless so look forward to that um mm -hmm. but the, the role was really i mean other than the the nudity which buddy um it was a really fun role to play uh i've always kind of wanted to do like a like old english talking like like witchy type person and so that was really fun and then also around that time murder size will be coming out um, yes i can't wait so for that that uh, is that movie was a lot of fun to work on and i feel like those uh uh those people making it angie and paul like they they really have a good handle on the whole like independent movie making thing like they were really good about like they came up with the costumes that I wear like all of that like they approved my hair and my makeup and stuff whereas a lot of other independent movies I work on they're just like just show up you know like <laughs> you know wear whatever you want just make sure you show up you know what I mean but they were like really into every aspect of the creation of this movie and I think it's gonna be super cool I'm sure you saw the um I'm sure you saw the poster that just came out. Mm -hmm. They finally released that. And I can't wait to have that on my wall. Like, it's going to be a lot of fun. And my part uh, with Drew, uh, I've never say, said his Marvick? last name out loud. Marvick. I don't know why I want to say Maverick. Marvick. Um, Drew, 
uh, we really just got to really cut up and like kind of like improv some of our parts like and that's gonna be like I'm really excited for my friends to see that like how funny that was because it's just I, I don't want to give away the scene but um, it's kind of sexy and then it just goes off the wall like I can't wait to see like what parts they keep in the actual film but I'm, I'm actually interviewing Paul and Angie on uh, Thursday so oh, no. you know yeah I'm really excited they're going to be on frights of the round table and uh i'm just really excited just to just chat with both of them because uh and i'm going to be watching their three ones that are on tubi like slasher at party and stuff beforehand just to get some slasher you know. at party is really really cool like I, I can't wait to hear what you think of that one but i'll let you um, know definitely all, all everything i've seen from them has just been super cool and i was really excited this is my first movie i got to do like in california so it's like (laughs) i'm also like almost in hollywood but no sacramento (laughs) (laughs) but like close enough um but it was just really really fun and i'm excited to finally show all my friends that movie but um you can always see like whatever indiegogo campaign that's currently going on on my website and that's just the does it all.com and i always list the ones that are active on there that you can like pre-order your movie from uh instead of like going through me which of course i enjoy that because i get to sign it and i i put like a little note card in there and everything and i i randomly i have like I'm a hoarder. So I have like all these knickknacks. So I'll just throw something in there, like for you to enjoy, like some random yeah. thing I have. Um, but yeah, but you can also just pre-order my movies before they even come out from the Indiegogo campaigns. And I try to push those because it's really important that these movies get funded so they can hire me. And so I can continue mm. to help other people realize their art. Like yeah. I get to be a part of their project and that's just so fun for me. And I just saw, and I got, because I can't remember anything anymore, but um, it was the one where you were playing the psychiatrist. Um, oh, yeah. And you were really, really good in that, too. I, I, I wanted oh, to commend you. Sorry? Did you, you saw Deadly Dealings? Yes, Deadly Dealings. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's probably, honestly, that's my favorite role I've done so far because I really got to throw myself into it. And also, Adam Freeman, the director, he was so on point with exactly how he wanted that role to be played. He's an amazing director. This is his first movie. And like, I really like, I've seen a lot of people's first movies and come on now. Like they're not like, I mean, it's everybody's got to have a first, you know, everybody's right. got to have a first movie and you're working through learning how to be a director, how to be a filmmaker and all those things. But like, he was just so, good about letting me know what he needed from me like as an actress that and like in the character building like the whole he was like angie and and paul he was he was onto every aspect he knew exactly how he wanted my hair he knew exactly how he wanted my makeup he was really great about that so i really 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 hope adam continues to make these because i think they're only just going to get better and better and better and i mean i i that movie i i showed my mom like i never send links mm-hmm. whenever it was like in the um film in the film uh competition uh there was that link and i guess that's where you saw it but um i sent the link to my mother and i never do that <laughs> like i never do that and I, mm-hmm. she was really proud of me and i can't wait for my all my friends to see that movie as yeah, well it was it was a good movie i thought you were really really good in it and it seemed like you were kind of channeling a little bit of like martha stewart into your character i don't know whether you did that intentionally or not but that's kind of what i picked up at uh, i think i just really really enjoyed the the touch that you gave him thank you i appreciate that sure. and i i loved uh i absolutely loved you and uh the embalmers uh and everything so when i saw that you know uh that was uh rebecca and uh rob's movie that they they did together uh with you i just I loved it. I I absolutely thought you were great. You know, you're probably my favorite character there. So I I like really? we keep you know we keep seeing things that you're doing. Or just like oh my god, like yeah, we are, uh, we are definitely just a flux simps. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we're not just saying that because you're on here. You know, <laughs> just so you know, we're not you know just blowing smoke up your ass. We're being serious. We love it, and we want more people to see that. So. Uh, do you have any films on Tubi right now? Do you know of? 
Um, actually, I do. I have uh, he knows on there. Um, nice. Oh, okay, yeah. All part in he knows, but um, kind of like the embalmers, because actually I met the director Steve Morris. On he's in the embalmers. He has a small part in the embalmers. He's like one of the bad guys. Um, like I actually like tase him in a scene. <laughs> Um, but anyways, um, like the embalmers, the whole set, the whole week that I worked on that, it was a party. Like after we wrapped for the day, we all got into the wine. We all like showed each other either movies that we had been in or well, other people because I hadn't really had anything to show at that point. But um, like movies they had been in or like just cool movies that had like a huge influence on them. So like that, like on the set of He Knows, we kind of got to party a little bit and then like watch movies together and have a good time but um i haven't watched it yet i'll i'm just gonna say that because i don't watch my movies by myself because i'm like super critical and weird so i always watch it with my best friend leslie because then we can laugh at myself <laughs> like we can laugh at me even though like i can like take it seriously and enjoy the movie and everything but i can like have humor about it so if i'm like oh i really didn't deliver that line very good or anything like that like i don't feel that way because i have my best friend there but um that is my only movie on tubi and i'm so excited that it's on tubi and i can't believe i haven't watched it yet but i'm like i'm trying to like wait for a time to watch it with my best friend so yeah and i still need to see because you sent me a couple movies of yours which was uh cannibal hookers I believe yes. you're in that. Oh, and um, that. and yeah, he wants to see, well, he wants to see anything called Cannibal and Hookers together. Yeah, it's Donald you know? Farber. Yeah, it's Donald yeah. Farber. We, we've interviewed Donald. We love Donald. Um, when we reviewed, well, Paul wasn't a part of it, but when we reviewed Shark Exorcist, it was uh, Jackie Hall who picked it. Uh, she was the special guest, like uh, host or whatever. And she, she had to pick something. So she knew that like, if she said anything like negative about something, you know, that Donald didn't care, you know, some people, some people are very picky about, oh man, you can't say anything negative about my movie. How dare you? But Donald just is like, yeah, I know what I make, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy it, you know? And so, so uh, we did shark exorcist for that. So we're really excited um, to uh, I'm excited to see cannibal hookers. I'm also really excited to see reunion from hell and stuff so thank you for sending me those because those those two were things on my like bucket list of movies i wanted to make sure i mm -hmm. i got at some point you know or whatever so oh is reunion from hell is my favorite movie that i have to sell like sale sell i can't talk right now because like you know like post-production takes forever so technically i only have three movies that i can sell and that's embalmers um cannibal hookers and reunion from hell and reunion from hell is like the first like big lead i actually got to play and i got pulled into the um into the production uh really last minute because the person that was going to play that decided that it wasn't for her and uh it was a challenge it was really a it, like that being in that movie taught me how to learn lines quickly it taught me how to like uh, really figure out who I'm going to be in a movie, like at a, like a short notice. And right. um, I'm available by the way, if anybody needs a short notice person, like that's kind of my forte. Like I feel very good about it. Um, but I actually got to really act in that movie and I'm really excited to hear what you think of that too. Yeah. I'm excited for like, I'm just excited to see you blow up so much, you know, you're and doing we so much. Need you. We need you, Jess. We need you at Indie Film Cafe. Well, you know, we need you in Austin Cyclic Productions, our stuff. So we are planning to work together. Hopefully, that well, this will be March, so this year, you know, hopefully. So um, we're we're planning on it. We're just we're just working out details and money. You know, and that's money is always the worst part of indie indie film stuff. So once again, when Chroma made Sergeant Kabuki Man for four million dollars, oh, and if we have four million dollars, we would make. Like we had 50 movies. One million. Just one million. Ugh. You know, one million we make like three movies. <laughs> you no. know, like no. I wouldn't want to make a one million dollar movie as like a first movie because I'd be like, that's just sort of a waste of like money right there. You know, like it, we could do a lot, you know, of things with, with just one million dollars. But, you know, I mean, we're not whining. We're just for. Just asking, whining a little bit. <laughs> if anybody wants to come out and give us money, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll make more than one movie with a million dollars. Come on, Namco, come to us. And we'll give you, uh, well, 
Yeah, I don't know, Paul. I think you'd be like the Lloyd Kaufman of the group, <laughs> trying oh, to yeah. trying to put you know the nudity and all this other stuff into it that we can't sell to kids. I know? have all the wacky ideas. Usually, M Mr. Moody is the restraint one. I know. I'm the Michael Hers of the group. I really am. I'm the guy who's like, you know, has has to restrain because I want I want to get more. Like I wanted to us to to grow and to get bigger, you know. And I feel like sometimes, uh, unless you're trauma or you know full moon, you're not. Uh, if you do the wacky stuff, sometimes people won't watch that, you know. And I want puppets and cows and hedgehogs and manatees and wacky you know crazy th you know invaders from outer space and robot mm -hmm. laser penguins and all of the good stuff yeah jess is just like okay <laughs> uh, i'm down for whatever see that's that's what we need paul we yep. need somebody just down for whatever so there, there you, go. you go thank you jessa <laughs> well once again uh thank you and so you say your uh site is jessa uh Jessa does it all.com and that has all of my socials and all of my active Indiegogos and you just you can contact me through there so you can always hit me up and buy a movie whatever I have available and I'll send you a sticker and like some random knickknack thing for my house and it'll be fun <laughs> there you go there you go we really appreciate that like that you go the extra effort for people you know so you know, I was really happy that I got that little card. So thank you. That was very, that was very sweet. I showed Paul it, you know, later, like that was really sweet, you know? And yeah. And, and I think for the, for the last couple of years, you know, meeting, you know, getting to meet you and, and Angel Bradford, you guys, you two have become two of my favorite people on the planet. So I've been very, very pleased that uh, I, have you know, met both of you and, um, you know, we got to work with Angel. So I can't wait to get to work with you. So that should yes. be fun. Both are in Debbie Does da uh, Demons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I think she's Debbie, right? Or something. She is Debbie. She's Debbie. Yeah. So there you go. I'm and what? I'm the demon. You're the there demon. There you go. So, <laughs> so she does you. All right. <laughs> sounds like a fun <laughs> time. <laughs> you know, sounds like a fun time to me. Um. So anyway, well, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Jessa, and thank you, Paul, for coming on this show and thank you guys for listening uh if you guys want to hit us up we're at indiefilmcafe.reviews we're at indiefilmcafe.poppy.com sickflickproductions.com and if you want to help us out with a little moolah a little cash uh we we do a patreon uh patreon.com backslash indie film cafe just one dollar just one dollar gets you a uh like a free uh free movie that you can listen to and a real, real like podcast that we, nobody else get on gets this. to it yeah so nobody else gets to it only our patreon folks and uh every month we we do a new one yep so there you go so check us out on there and uh let us know what you guys think until then everybody have a good one bye, bye.